oh, you know, if he, you know, going into Sunday, you know, this could change his life. And, you know, then I get into a tournament and I'm like, no, this is golf. This is, I've done this a million times. And the other part too, is I almost think that being in contention of those days is almost freeing because it's like, you only get this a few times. Like you get four a year. If you're lucky, you get four a year and you may be content in one. So enjoy the moment and leave nothing behind. Pass the torch, man. Keeps getting better. We can dive right into it. So Will Zalatoris down here in Dallas, your new home. Um, there's a lot of studs from the game of golf right now in Dallas that are in Texas. Jordan Spee, Scotty Scheffler's here. So is it kind of a new hotbed? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, California, Texas, Florida are your three main hubs. Um, I moved here uh, from California uh, when I was nine. I started playing competitive golf once I moved here. And honestly, I got lucky. I mean, my first event I ever played in was at Bear Creek West in 2005. And I think Jordan shot 81 in the 20 or the 12 to 13 year old division as like a 10 year old or some something. And then Scotty finished second. So like we've been playing together for 17 years. I mean, that's that's the part that I have to like almost pinch myself when I'm looking up on leaderboards right. and I like look at the guys that I'm playing against, like I've played with these guys for 15, 17 years. Right. And so, you know, when I get asked, you know, Hey, what's it like to play with these guys? I'm like, they're regular dudes. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've had more beers with some of these guys and I've had rounds of golf with them. Yeah. Like, you know, so it's, it's been really good because you know, the way how you get better is you play. And so being able to have competition year round here in, in Dallas, but then on top of that, having, I mean, it's 76 today. It's going to be 40, I'm sure, in the next few days. And, it, you know, you get rain, you get wind, you, you get hot, you get cold. So, I mean, that's huge for us. You know, being in a dome and being in Palm Springs is, you know, you have that once a year. You know, where how we prepare prepares for everything. And I think that's part of the reason why you're seeing more and more guys move here is just because of the challenge of, you know, the conditions. Right, 100%. My first time in Dallas, the weather's been phenomenal. We're here in mid-December. Um, but so you mentioned you started playing when you moved to Dallas mm -hmm. at nine. So that's when you picked up the sticks that late. Well, so I, I, I basically, when I was three or four, um, I'd go out with my dad. He'd play golf with his dad or he played golf, uh, in the morning with his boys. And then I would go out and we'd play one, two, three hit our drives on four, come up nine and go home. And I'd have a orange Julius milkshake and it was, it was at California golf club. And that was like yeah. the greatest thing ever. Um, and I always loved it, you know, and then, um, basically, you know, I had a coach who was at this driving range and that's where I really got to catch the bug was they basically just gave me unlimited balls, you know, let me go hit up, you know, where they would teach just so mm -hmm. that I could be around them. And they just, it was basically daycare. I mean, I would just hit ball after ball after ball and just fell in love with it. And then I didn't really start playing tournaments until I moved here. Um, we actually moved here because of my dad's job. Really? And so, you know, like I said, when I say that we were pretty lucky, I mean, you know, my dad's job was the main reason why we moved here. And then it just, everything fell into place from there. Yeah. And you're already playing in some of the biggest tournaments, like you mentioned with Jordan, mm -hmm. with Scheffler early on, was it always your goal to become a pro golfer on the PGA tour? Yeah. You know, I don't really think I'd ever like thought of doing anything else. Um, there was no other sports growing up. Well, I mean, I pitched. You know, I loved pitching, but the only thing I could hit was low and away. I mean, where's a golf ball? So yeah. I was like, this sucks. <laughs> you know, like I'd spend all this time like working on my golf swing and they come out and they get three straight heaters at the top of the zone. I had nothing but uh, baseball and basketball. But, you know, it was just, you know, golf is a solitary thing and you can make what you want of it. You know, basketball, you know, whatnot, you have to have teams. And, you know, obviously, you know, you can play as good as you want, but, you know, you still need to be you know, it relies on the other players. And that's just me. I've, I'm, a, I'm an only child. I've always been very independent. You know, no one's really ever has to ask me to like go practice type thing. Um, so I always loved it. I mean, I even having baseball practice at like 8 a.m. on Saturdays, it was like by 10, 15, I'm on the driving range. Yep. So. Yeah. And then so you had obviously super successful 
early career and then you go off to Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. So what was the life of a D1 golfer? If you can put me in your shoes, like day to day, are you just hitting the range every day, getting better? I know the facilities there were just phenomenal. Yeah. Ooh. So, I mean, long story short, I had always wanted to go to Stanford. That mm -hmm. was kind of my dream goal and it didn't work out. I mean, I had the grades and everything, but just recruiting classes and whatnot. Um, you know, just is kind of how it worked out. But then, you know, so people quit, quit following me because I knew that I was waiting for Stanford to come along and basically end up going to Wake Forest on the Arnold Palmer scholarship. And, you know, when I tell people, you know, Hey, why'd you choose Wake? It's like my decisions made for me, Yeah. you know, on the Arnold Palmer scholarship, it's a top 30 school. And then on top of that, it's one of the richest histories when it comes to, or it comes to college golf. But I mean, basically, you know, when you're in season, um, at least the way how we did it is you have to have class in the morning. So you go from eight to one, you know, grab a quick lunch. We would either have qualifying starting at two. So you'd have a pretty quick turnaround or we would be on our, on, at our facilities, just basically having a three or four hour practice. You'd work out either at five or 6 PM, grab a quick dinner by the time, you know, you're showered up and everything it's probably around seven, seven thirty, and you're busting until probably 11 and, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. Yep. And so, you know, it really, the time management aspect of it, and as especially in college golf, because that's just when you're home now, all of a sudden you like college golf, you miss the most amount of school compared to any sport right. because you're playing Monday, Tuesday, or it's, Oh, we're playing Saturday, Sunday, and you're leaving Thursday. So you miss a ton of school. And so, you know, I remember, I think I had like a three, eight at midterms, my first semester. And I was like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is cakewalk. And I think I finished with like a three Oh or something like that. Yeah. Like literally, I think I might've dropped like a full GPA point in right. like the last month and a half, just because of like, oh wait, That'll like happen. we're gone for you know tournaments and whatnot. But the time management taught me a lot because, I mean, when it comes to professional golf, now all of a sudden you're, you know, you've got a pro-am, you've got a sponsor value thing, you know, and so you just have to be on top of things. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you talk about missing school with golf, and now you're on the PGA Tour. It's probably one of the most sports where you miss the most time at home because all your tournaments are – you don't have a home game, basically. Yeah. So yeah. maybe that once in Dallas tournament a year or so. Um, turning to your busiest week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turning to, uh, your professional career and kind of your schedule. I'm always curious, like what's an off day look like on like a Tuesday before a tournament? Are you just like getting mentally dialed in? Is it all reps? But just like walk me through a Tuesday before a turn a week. Yeah, no, I mean, I can give you a full tournament week. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, regular tournament show up Monday, maybe play nine holes or just you know, if it's I'll only play nine holes on a Monday, if it's the first week of a stretch, I'll never touch a club on a Monday mm. during like a stretch of three or four. Um, but Tuesday, Wednesday, because we now have mainly nine hole pro ams, which has been great um, on Wednesdays. So I'll play 27 holes total between Tuesday, Wednesday. So nine hole pro am, I'll play 18 on Tuesday. Um, but Tuesdays basically, you know, for a full day, um, in perspective, I mean, basically I try to get out there and, and tee off by eight because there's always a rush for the guys at nine 30, um, you know, go through the entire golf course. I'll spend some time with Josh Gregory, my short game coach. If Troy's there, we maybe hit a few balls. I'll spend about an hour in the gym, um, with Damon at the end of the day, and then I'm done. And so the big thing, you know, the biggest difference between a regular event and majors is I don't play 18 at all. Right. It's always nine, nine, nine. And normally I get there on Sunday. So you'll have four straight days at nine holes and it's all energy conservation. I mean, th those weeks, they're basically two weeks in themselves just with, you know, everything that goes on with them. But you know, I've been lucky that I've been in contention yeah. a bunch over the last couple of years. And it, I mean, it, I don't sleep on Sundays just cause I'm so wired and Pavs and I have actually talked about this and, you know, I don't go to bed till like five in the morning, Wow! but it's like, it takes me to Thursday to get back to normal. And so like, I've had to talk, I mean, we've talked about it a ton, but, um, I've just basically said, I'm not playing a, like any week after a major, like I'm useless. I'm, I'm not done. playing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, I, the part that people don't see is that, you know, when you're playing in a tournament, you know, if they say, oh, you have a morning tea time, like, yeah, you guys going to go out and go do something, you know, go see, you know, go sightseeing. And it's like, well, if I tee off at eight, I'm up at five. 
spend an hour in the gym, hour and a half warming up, go play, takes five hours, maybe do 30, 40 minutes on the putting green or hitting balls. Then you've got another 30, 40 minutes in the gym doing post-hab stuff. So by then it's already 2.30, 3 o'clock mm -hmm. and you've been up since five working. So it's like, I don't have time. Yeah. Like, and so that's kind of the thing that I've laughed about with my fiance, Caitlin, is it's like, we may need to go back to some of these places when I'm done with my career just to see Check them. them out. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't have time. Yeah. No, that's super interesting. So you imagine your time in the gym, right? And mm -hmm. so obviously it's no, it's no secret. Mm -hmm. You don't have the build of Brooks Kepka or Bryson <laughs> DeChambeau, but you're one of the longest hitters on tour. Mm -hmm. So like what goes into your hour session at the gym? Is it kind of weight trading, like flexibility? Like what, what's that process like? Right now? I mean, you know, so I've been out for a couple months, finally back all unhealthy. Um, I enlisted the help of Greg Rose, which Greg's a fascinating guy. He runs Tireless Performance Institute and Greg, he works with pitchers, hockey players, soccer players, golf or golfers, tennis. I mean, he was helping the Oklahoma women's softball team before mm. he helped me, which is what they're nasty. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, 69 miles an hour from 43 feet is the equivalent of 97 miles an hour in MLB. Yeah. I mean, that's just gross, but basically what we're doing now is it's all correctives and so like we found out why i got injured and it it's crazy to think that part of the genesis is because i have bad ankle mobility on my right mm -hmm. side and so basically if you think of a golf swing it's rotational but it's also vertical and so what happens with me is i kind of bend my spine to the right and then because of the bad ankle mobility i don't keep my weight on the inside of my foot it works on the outside then goes to the middle and then i push and that's when i obviously like start the downswing and so the problem with that was is that when you push late your right hip gets high and then your back bends so now all of a sudden you create all that that tension on the disc and so we've basically had to go in the gym and just basically do full correctives like i need to work a lot on my left hip my right ankle and throughout the season it's just going to get worse and worse and worse just because yep. you it's the same repetitive motion. Yep. And so we spend 95% of my time doing correctives, whether it's flexibility, stability, or mobility with those two aspects. So it's not, you're not really changing your swing. It's more doing exercises in the gym that will help certain areas of your swing. Yeah. You know, I think it's I'm changing my posture for sure, but yeah. the swing part, I mean, most of the golf swing comes from setup. Yep. You know, how you set up determines how you swing. And so we're trying to get me to just get in a posture that's a little bit healthier and a little bit more functional. And so, you know, when I came in to go see him, I was swinging probably five miles an hour off of my top speed from last year. And I left within 36 hours back to full speed. Mm -hmm. And that's just getting me to do the proper body motion. And so that stuff was mind blowing to me. Yep. You know? You're clearly a student of the game. And like, I think it takes a what do you have like trackman is that what you guys use to kind of mm -hmm. look at all those stats and whatnot like how much of your time also off the course mm -hmm. in tournament play is like film study and things like that yeah you know i so like there's a little bit of a give and take when it comes to using trackman because you could sit there and try to dial in you know certain numbers or attack angles and whatnot but you're in a controlled environment yeah you know you're in basically on the range hitting one shot over and over and over and you basically need to go out and play as much as you can. So for me, I like spending more time on the golf course than I do on the range. That's just how I am. Everybody does it differently. I mean, you know, that's the thing that I've learned a lot is everyone has their process. It's just finding what works for you. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I'd probably say, you know, I, to kind of give you a quick story, I missed the cut here at the Nelson last year. I uh, was kind of struggling with my ball striking, putted terrible and, I miss a cut, so I grind Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and this is leading up into the PGA Championship. And I'm like, I've just fully accepted that I'm like, I'm not at my best. Like, right. I've got a lot of work to do. We've kind of got to reverse engineer some things here. And so Wednesday night, I literally sat down for an hour. This is Wednesday night before the PGA. And I sat down, looked at my phone, looked at some videos, and I was like, man, that's something's off here with – kind of how I'm looking at the ball, like my my neck is tilted back, which is kind of explaining why I keep pushing putts. And then I look at my full swing, it's the same thing. And so I went out the next morning and I think I birdied four out of my first five and made like three 30 footers. And 
And it was just funny how like I spent all that time grinding and searching and couldn't get anywhere. And right. then just sitting down for an hour looking at a video. And then next thing you know, I almost won. Right. And so that was a pretty big lesson learned that I, I'm huge on video to make sure that I'm able to see the progression and make sure I'm doing things correctly, especially now coming off injury to make sure that I'm doing things right in my posture. But now, I mean, I'm, I've probably, we actually was talking to this the other day with Josh. I have 9,000 photos in my phone and 6,000 of them are, are swing videos. Wow. So it's, it's a lot. That's not a healthy mix. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you mentioned you, you play second, uh, you lost mm -hmm. in a playoff to JT at that mm -hmm. PGA championship, but rewinding a little bit. So mm -hmm. 2021 season, mm -hmm. you burst onto the scene, right? You come in second place at the masters at Augusta. How surreal was that feeling for you? Like, I think it was your first time at Augusta, right? So I had played once before, but playing in January at Augusta is nothing even remotely close in April because they spend literally 11 months and three weeks out of the year to prepare, to prepare for one right. week. And so, you know, the fairways are longer, the greens are softer. It, it's just nothing even close to it. Yeah. Um, but you know, the whole week, I just basically tried to enjoy it because I think eight weeks prior, I had, I had played seven in a row leading up to that. And I was outside the top 50 in the world. And kept getting into events that were top 50. And so I played, I had never played seven in a row in my life. And so all of a sudden it's, oh, hey, you're done. Now you're in the masters. Yeah. And so, you know, to go from basically trying to get into events to all of a sudden, oh, hey, you're in the next four majors was, you know, holy cow. Right. Um, but, you know, that whole experience, it was pretty cool too, because it was the second, it was still kind of COVID time. So they only had 5,000 people there. So it was super intimate. You know, it was a, basically it felt like everyone on the golf course was on 18. Um, and that was it. That probably like, helped a little bit. Oh yeah. And it was cool. Yeah. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, it definitely did help, you know, especially the first couple of days I played nicely, but, um, you know, I think I learned more from that Saturday being in the final group than I think even what I did on Sunday. Um, just given the fact that it's like, hey, this is your first time ever being in a final group in a PJ Tour event, let alone a major. Um, but, you know, I came out the next day and I birdied or came out on Sunday and I started off birdie birdie. And, you know, it's the, go time. The, yeah, the line that I think my caddy used is weapons free. Let's go. Which, yeah, <laughs> like from Navy SEALs where he's like weapons free boys. And I was like, yeah, it's on. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was. You know, I saw Hideki hit it in the water on 15 and, you know, got me back in it and made a putt on 18 to kind of stay in it. He birdied 17. But, you know, it's just it, it was a week that basically I went from kind of the kid who, you know, hey, he's pretty good golfer to like Adam Sandler sending me a text message saying <laughs> like, super cool what you're doing. And I'm like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. Like that was, that was honestly the thing that was the weirder part was getting a text and seeing, Hey, it's Adam S like super cool what you're doing. And I'm like, Sandler. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, so the story there obviously is like, it's now famous, but like yeah. you look like his caddy from happy Gilmore. Right. Have you ever met his caddy? No, but I, I read an article that he's like a professor in New York now. Really? Yeah. Like he's, he's like some, I want to say he's like a, biology professor or something it's like like that's hilarious yeah i'm like you were famous for basically being like straddled by happy gilmore <laughs> yeah. being shook and now you're like solving the world's problems yeah like, we didn't right. we didn't make that meeting happen we'd love to see <laughs> yeah. you two on the course together yeah so i i've i've actually um he's somewhere up in new york but i do need to meet him at some point that's too good and so i feel like you talked about a little bit you don't play 18 holes before major in sports like NFL, basketball, you always hear coaches talking about like approaching the playoffs the same way as a regular season game. But you you just really can't do that when it's major week. Like you can't approach Augusta the same way you approach a, a regular tournament. They're they're different in the sense that you basically like I broke this down actually just talking the other day and it's like let's say you play for 10 years and you get in all four majors. So you're in 40 majors over your career. And let's say you contend in th four, you know, you finish in the top 10 in like four of them. You essentially have like 
12 days of your life that you're like in contention to win a major. Mm -hmm. Like that's insane when you kind of think about that. And so for me, like I've always had, like my life goal has always to been, has always been to win a major. Don't care which one, we'll take any of one of the four. But it's, you know, even kind of taking this into the account of like, you know, the live versus PGA tour aspect. Like I, there's no amount of money that could take me away from trying to win a major. I could go play in a major and if I got paid five bucks, but I got the trophy, great. But those weeks to me, I try to get rid of every aspect off the golf course possible. You know, we basically, we don't watch golf channel. I turn off my phone. You know, Romo actually told that to me before the first masters. Uh, he just said, your life's going to change next week. Turn off your phone. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And of course, like blowing up. Yeah. I mean, I op opened up my phone and I think I went from like 10,000 followers on like Instagram to like 150 wow. within like three days. And I'm like, well, might want to delete a few photos now. <laughs> like, um, but um, it, I try to just keep everything at bay because I loved watching, you know, like the rich learner essays of like, oh, you know, if he, you know, going into Sunday, you know, this could change his life. And, you know, then I get into a tournament and I'm like, no, this is golf. This is golf. This is, I've done this a million times. Right. And the other part too is I almost think that being in contention of those days is almost freeing because it's like you only get this a few times like you get four a year if you're lucky you get four a year and you maybe contend in one right. so enjoy the moment and leave nothing behind and so that's why i think in a weird way the thing that i've taken away from this time off is that the majors i almost have lower or i almost have no expectations and then in pga tour events I've had an expectation of like, Hey, I need to go out and win these. Yep. But in reality, PJ tour events actually have better fields than majors. Right. So it's like, why would you have no expectations when you're going into a major, but then in regular events, you're like, Hey, you know, I, I should be winning one or two a year. And that was kind of a mind switch for me. And that's something that I'm kind of looking forward to is like, we've even talked about as a team, like treating one regular event a year, like a major. Just because it's like, if this process works, right. like, why don't you do that all the time? Yeah, because you have all these top 10 finishes, right, in majors. Yeah. You come in second place, as you mentioned, at the PGA Championship this past year, 2022, and then also the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. But the whole kind of media creates this storyline that Will Zalatoris can't get over the hump in majors. Like, <laughs> how much do you let, like, that bullshit, like, get to you? Or is it just, like, fuel you? Or is it, like, one ear out the other? I mean... I can't say that I don't listen to it, given the reaction that I gave when I won Memphis. Right. I, because that was not scripted at all. Like me saying what I said was just, you know. What are like, they going to say now? Yeah. I mean, when I said that, like that was not scripted whatsoever. Now, I loved what I love Steph's story of like, hey, you got bad ankles. You're too small. can't lead a team like, you know, hey, Steph on Curry. Do you want to sign with Nike? I mean, I don't know if you ever heard that story. No, but. Uh, Steph, when he was sitting in a meeting with Nike, when he first was coming out of college, they kept calling him Stefan. Oh, really? And so it's part of the reason why I was with Under Armour. But like, if anything, I think it's hilarious because like, I, I really don't care, right. long story short, but I just kind of find it funny where it's like, you know, people actually care about what you're doing. And that's the part of the, that's the part of the fun. It's like, if you're doing something good, you're going to get criticized. Yeah. You know? So for me, like I actually take joy out of it and I actually find it hilarious. Meanwhile, like my family would be like, Hey, did you see this article this guy wrote about? I'm like, no, I don't read that stuff. Like, you know, if I if I see something a guy maybe wrote or whatever, and then all of a sudden I do something good, like I'll be I'll be the first one to go up to him the next time I see him and I'm like, Hey, you know, if I prove him wrong or did something, you know, like, oh, this guy's never gonna win a tournament, you know. See him in Delaware the next week and hey, like, hey, loved that article you wrote. Right. It was pretty good. Right. Yeah. You, you don't need the media to tell <laughs> no. you you're good enough to win. You and know you're all, good enough to and win. And it's all in good fun, too. Yeah. Like, that's what that's why, like, you know, these guys are out there obviously trying to find stories and exactly. it's their job. And so, you know, for me, it's like, you know, hey, I'll I'll give you a story, but you know, at the same time, like, I'm gonna kneel you for fun. Like, yes. I don't take it personally, but it's like you know, we're going to have some fun with this. I like that approach. And so you mentioned your win. It's the FedEx Cup playoffs first round, I think in Memphis you mentioned. And that was your first round with your new caddy, right? Yeah. And so uh, what does like your new caddy say on the 72nd hole on Sunday? You're in contention to win. Like, what does he do to kind of calm you down, maybe handle the pressure when things are tense? 
<laughs> so he wrote dad jokes in his yardage book all day was one of the things that he did. And it got to a point where whenever things got kind of tense or maybe if I made a bogey or whatever, he would say some stupid dad joke that I would just like. What's at the best him. one he had? I thank God I blocked them all out of my memory because <laughs> they, they were so bad, but they were more of like anytime he'd say one of the jokes, I'd just kind of look over at him like, really? Like <laughs> that that's that's what you did last night. This is how you're preparing for this. But um, no, but Joel actually Joel was really good at basically just keeping the day super light. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was really cool was I had like a 12 footer on like a part i think it was on like 12 and i i walked it in and it lipped out and immediately we both just like started laughing because that was to get the solo lead back got it and you know every shot obviously matters coming in but we it was just kind of funny how we both just looked at each other and we just were like well that was stupid and then go up tap it in go to the next hole and one of the things I think was amazing of how you just know it's your week, besides the playoff and everything that happened with The Rock and whatnot, and we'll get to that, but the thing that I think is the defining moment of, the, of that tournament was actually the fifth hole, I hit it on the right rough, and I was thinking of kind of punching a seven iron underneath this tree, and Joel looks at me and says, this is a perfect flyer wedge. And I'm thinking, this guy's been on the bag for three days, and he just told me to not only change from one club, but four clubs. Yeah, four clubs down. Yeah, and I'm like, it granted different shot, but I'm like, the stones that you have to have to say that when I'm trying to win my first tournament, and I've had, I don't even know how many second places I'd had to the, right. up to that point, that's a defining moment. And I knew I hit a great shot, hit it to like 15 feet. And I knew that moment I was like, this is going to be, this is going to be a good day. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I buried the first three, I was on a roll, but it was just like the second that he called me off that shot and changed shots was a defining moment going forward that I was like, this is, this is the day. That's a ballsy call, right? Yeah. There. I mean, for any caddy, let alone a guy's on the fourth day on the job. Right. I mean, so you know, the, the playoff and everything, I've got to give him a lot of credit when you're 15 feet away from the hole and your balls wedge between a rock and the, and the edge of the lip of the rough. It's like, all I have to do is move this ball literally a foot forward and I win the golf tournament. That was an because, insane situation. And I mean, literally, I mean, that was the part that we laughed about on the plane. They're like, you literally need to move a ball, move that ball a foot. Now, if you move it a foot backwards, you lose the golf right. tournament. You know, because it's basically wedged up against it. And if it just hits the bank and comes back in, you know, you lose. So, I mean, he told me literally 15 times. He's like, go to the drop zone, go to the drop zone. And it's like, you're so tempted because you're like literally, you know, almost double the distance from me to you from the hole. And you're like, I've got to go all the way back over there yeah. to try to win this golf tournament. And um, th thankfully it worked out. But it was, like I said, the things that he did, you know, in contention, I mean, I've you know, like the conviction was the thing that I thought was really cool from a guy who had been there for basically six days. Right. Yeah. It's cool to see. And so obviously you get the win, silence the doubters that you can't get over the hump, fuck them. And then, um, so now you're building off that, but the next week you kind of had to drop out of that next playoff round because you're back, but you're still building off that heading into this next PGA season, right? Like, are you ready to go? How's the back feel like you geared up for a big 2023? Yeah, I think, I think this has been a pretty good blessing in disguise. I think um, being able to find, you know, this stuff now where I'm young enough to where it's basically, all right, here's your, you know, take one shot. We're going to take three months off. We're going to have to maybe make a few changes in your posture, you know, which is hard because when you're the best, ball, you know, number one ball striker on tour, it's like, why would I ever want to change anything? It's right. like, you know, it's a thing that I always talk about with the guys at Titleist is it's like I play the 2019 version golf ball on the 2020 uh, irons and I just switched to the new ball. But there, you know, it's kind of like if I'm playing this good, you know, why change? It ain't broke, don't fix yeah. it. Yeah. And so like now, I mean, I'm actually going to switch irons now too. But the whole thing that I just really think has been amazing through this process is just seeing 
how since I've come back, the progression and the less stress that I'm putting on my body, I think um, this mental break has been good too. I mean, it's been a wild two years to kind of comprehend because basically 25 months ago, I was on Corn Ferry. Yep. And, you know, now I'm moved all the way up to seventh in the world. And it's just kind of like, okay, let's sit back and let's try to appreciate everything that's happened, but also learn from some of the mistakes. And so that's why I think this three month span has been a really, really good blessing in disguise because I've learned a lot. My body's going to be in the best shape it's ever been in. And, you know, having a mental break and being fresh before, you know, the a big push next year for a Ryder Cup is is going to be awesome. Yeah, can't wait to see it. And so you mentioned the Ryder Cup. I think you had to sit out of the President's Cup this year, but I think you're hanging around the team with the guys and kind of you got the feel for it. How excited are you for a team event? Yeah, I, you know, I, I played on a Walker Cup team and when I was an amateur, I guess, in college, and there's just nothing like it. I mean, anything, any pressure that you think you kind of feel in tournaments, like I wasn't even hitting a shot and I was nervous standing on the yeah. first tee. And there's just, it's just such a cool experience to wear the red, white, and blue and, you know, having former presidents come in and, you know, basically talk to the teams and, you know, Roy Williams was given a speech about, um, I actually gave a speech to the team before the first round talking about, uh, when he was coaching Kobe on, on team USA and, um, it, you know, it just, all these guys, they basically just drill into you, you know, how important it is to wear the red, white, and blue and, you know, how lucky we are. And so it, it, you know, on top of that, the history and wanting to beat the crap out of the internationals or especially the Europeans, you know, yeah. it's, um, there's just no, there's just nothing like it in golf. Yep. And so the game of golf is unique, right? It's obviously you versus the rest of the field, but there's all these unique relationships. You see the bromance between Justin Thomas and Spieth. And so who are some guys that you've kind of gravitated towards or maybe have been like mentors for you earlier in your career? Yeah. You know, I think, I think Jordan has been really good to me. You know, I've, like I said, I've known him forever, but I mean, he basically set the bar for us in Dallas. You know, he won the U.S. Junior twice. Then Scotty Scheffler won it, then I won it, then Cole Hammer won it, then Noah Goodwin won it. I mean, it's been crazy yeah. you know, to think of the progression that we've had from on the junior golf side, even with him. But coming out of the gates at 19 and winning and then having to live the life that he had to live, um, where basically, you know, he's 22 years old and he's, I think, you know, the joke was he was 22, it was 22 sitting on 22 mil. Yes. I think he made 22 mil when he was that age and Under Armour basically said, Hey, you're our guy. You know, he's had to live a pretty intense life for 10 years on tour. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so being able to pick his brain about, you know, his life and what he's done, you know, Scotty, even though we're the same age, you know, being able to talk about, you know, our college experiences and now as a pro, um, you know, it's really cool. And, you know, Bill Haas has been a great friend of mine. And, um, but, you know, Davis Riley and I, you know, live together for when we first turned pro and uh it's kind of fun when you're hanging with guys and you know we you know for him it's jt who's been a mentor to him going to bama and you know for me obviously it's been jordan so you know it's pretty fun and it's pretty cool now when you're seeing guys win tournaments and you know some of their buddies are waiting for you on 18 and whatnot you know it, it's just it's a really cool time and it's it's fun because we all you know, all of our wives are friends. And so, you know, it is kind of one big fraternity in, in some aspect. Right. Have you ever had any relationship with Tiger at all? So, yeah, this is actually, I'll, I'll tell this story. This is probably the only thing I can say from being in the room in Delaware. Um, but I walk into the room and Tiger's talking to some of the other guys and he's sitting down, you know, obviously with his leg and and he uh, sticks his hand out and he goes, he's like, what's up, Willie? And I'm like, he's like, congrats, dude. I'm like, thanks, man. And, you know, thanks for being here and all that. And he goes, yeah, and by the way, why the fuck are you aiming at that pin on 11 in the playoff? <laughs> and I'm like, I was, I promise you I was aimed 20 feet left and I just hit a terrible golf shot. And he's like, I've seen you hit golf balls. Like, you were not aimed 20 feet left. And I was kind of like, yeah, you're kind of right. But, but he, uh, it was just so funny because that was like the first time I had like a real interaction right. with him. But, you know, he, uh, he's been great with, you know, everything that's gone on with the tour and live and, um, having him and Rory and, you know, really these guys that have been in the room in Delaware, you know, taking a stand for the tour and trying to get what's best for us is, has been a really, it's been a really, really cool time to be coming up. 
but it's also been at times pretty wild. It's a crazy time. And so obviously Tiger and Rory are the spokesmen for the PGA Tour right now, kind of that face. But have you felt the need over the last like few months to kind of step into a role to be more outspoken about the pros of the PGA Tour? You know, I think I think I have. Um, you know, and, and I'll be the first one to say this, that everything when it, in regards to the live PJ to argument, it's, it's evolving constantly. And so the thing that's, the thing that really kind of gets me is that, you know, probably if you asked me six months ago, I would have said, look, they're 54 hole competition. They only have 48 guys. Here's our official world golf ranking. They don't meet the criteria. They shouldn't be officially world golf rank recognized. Well, if you now think about it, you know, what's the point of having official work off ranking if the best players aren't actually on the ranking, you know, that defeats the purpose completely. So as much as I am pro PGA tour, they should get world ranking points right. and the world ranking system needs to be fixed. I mean, there's a lot of issues with it, but I just, the thing that I try to tell people is that, you know, PGA tour is about legacy and you are an independent contractor, but to be a part of the PGA Tour, all we ask is basically it's almost like a code of conduct. Just act this way because these are to get basically the benefits to give you or that we supply you. We here here's our criteria, and a small subset had a massive problem with how it was run, and most of those guys have gone to live. And there are some things that the tour absolutely needs to do better and we're fighting for it every day but greg norman and his vendetta against the tour from the 90s this is all right we trust me there's a lot of us on the pj tour side who have spoken a, a very harsh to a point where it seems like it's full-on war and we know that hey look they have unbelievable funding there's no i mean we're hearing stories right now about Ronaldo getting paid $211 million a year by, I mean, it's crazy. That's nuts. But the whole point that I have behind this is that, do you really want to go and, and side with specifically when with Greg, who his whole job is to ruin the PGA tour. And he obviously is promoting live, but we're trying to fix this for the players and for the top players, because in reality, you know, the top guys, if you reward the top guys, those guys bring the most value. Top guys get paid more. Now the middle guys get paid more. This is just how it works. It, it, it's it's how it's worked in every sport. And so, you know, the higher up you go with guys in contracts, the higher the minimum is. It's just, it is what it is. And so I, I think there is a middle ground, but the rhetoric right now, I think we're coming to terms with that. We need to be more softer and more welcoming. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that we want to promote them? Absolutely not. But at the same time, this, there needs to be a, a coming together and some peace in this, but the way how Greg's talking, he, he wants nothing to do with the PGA tour and he wants them gone. And so, you know, look, we were, I've, I'll be the first one to admit my stance on the official work off ranking was wrong, you know, but he needs to come to the table and be accepting of us as well. Right. And it sounds like you've heard this from Rory a number of times. Like there will be no collaboration between the tour and live until Greg is kind of out of that seat. And we've said this for a while. I mean, look, he's got a vendetta against the tour. I mean, that's just what happened in the nineties and the lawsuits and all that, you know, and now, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but like I said, we're, we're now at a point where, I mean, look, if we have the official world golf ranking and you know the tour and all everyone has a seat at the table you know essentially of the major uh tours that govern basically professional golf if they're able to sit at the table and change the official world golf ranking and we'll welcome them you know it's not just us you know it's not just the pga tour and then everybody else like this is look there were seven guys that were in the top 25 playing in dubai and then zero at sea island and Sea Island got more points than the guys in Dubai. That makes no sense. So that's why things need to change. If they have seven out of the top 25 in the world on live, they should get points. Right. That's just how it should be. But yeah. Yeah. the rhetoric needs to be softer. And you're, the live is never going to be able to emulate 
a, a major, like being at Augusta or being at the U S open. Like I'm never going to tune in on a Sunday to watch the live and like who's in contention. And like, that will never happen. And there's, you can't replace that being on the PGA tour. No, I mean, the one thing that, that scares me is some of the rhetoric that they've had about, you know, Hey, we'll create our own majors. The only thing that scares me is look, everyone's got a number. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think they offered tiger a billion dollars. And yeah, I look, I, they offered me a contract. They've offered every everybody pretty much in the top 50 a contract and yeah. it's tempting. But like I said, I, I, there's no amount of money that could take me away from majors. Yep. And if I'm able to play in majors, then, you know, like I said, my allegiance has been with the PGA tour, but at the same time, I'm going to go where the best players go. Right. You know, that's everyone's point of view. That's everyone's point of view. And it is, it is life-changing money. You probably have a few friends that have gone to the live tour and like have made their bag and have saved or done things for their family's life that they couldn't do on the PGA tour. I think the big difference in this though, and, and their numbers are starting. I mean, look, D, they're saying DJ made $38 million last year on the golf course. Yeah. Rory made 45. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, his guaranteed money that DJ had got for going obviously blows it out of the water. But if you kind of look at the middle guys that are on tour, if they were to go, they would make more money staying on tour. Yeah. That's just a fact, because if you become vested with the tour, our retirement's incredible. And yep. so the only difference though, is that you have to be vested and have to get to that point And then obviously wait it out until you're 50 to let your money grow. And then it becomes more. So if you want to take the guarantee because there's no guarantee, I mean, I get it. And that's why, you know, I have plenty of friends that have gone and they know my stance is very pro PGA tour, but it's like, it's like the example I give them is it's like, I'm not going to tell you how to raise your kids and yeah. you're not going to tell me how to raise mine. So that's kind of like, it's your life decision. It's for, for you and your family. Like I get it. hundred percent. So wrapping up live talk, but what are you so excited about for the PGA tour in the next decade? I think the big thing for us is that, you know, we ran 47 tournaments last year and two of them had the top 25, mm. uh, had all of the top 25. We're now pushing in the direction where we're looking at closer to like the 12 to 15 category, which on top of that, also having an actual off season is going to be very nice because we haven't had an off season. And I guess it's been since like what, 2009 or whatever. Um, I think having an off season for one, but being able to have the top guys show up more and more and more, you know, this is what F1 does so well. If they have 24 races, Lewis Hamilton's going to be at 24 yep. unless he randomly is injured or something happened out of his control. So the fact that you can now turn on the TV and know that, Hey, in these 15 events, essentially you're going to see Rory, you're going to see Jordan, you're going to see JT, you're going to see every single person in the top 25 is going to be huge for us going forward. And that's part of the draw with live is that look, they're 48 guys. Phil's going to be there every time. DJ's going to be there every time. Cam Smith's going to be there every time. So, you know, we needed to do a better job because the product got watered down because we had been trying to build more and more events and become, you know, golf on 24-7 year-round type thing. And look, that's just not sustainable. I mean, at some point in time, you're going to lose focus. And so I think for us going forward, having this new leadership, um, I mean, the new leadership in terms of the top players being able to have more say um, is pretty exciting. Yeah, and I think if the live is good for anything, I don't know if it's growing the game of golf, but it's helping the PGA Tour reevaluate kind of what's been wrong with their model. Oh, huge. I mean, it's it's absolutely – and look, you know, what some of these guys have said, like, you know, hey, without live, you know, without us, essentially, the PGA Tour would have made these changes. I'm like – yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I don't have a problem with that yeah. that argument at all. I mean, you know, now it's it's taken Liv and 22 guys meeting in a room in Delaware to get stuff passed. So mm -hmm. it's been a collaborative effort on on all sides. But, you know, in the long run, it's um, it's going to be really exciting, especially with, I mean, average golfer now winning on tour is like 27. Right. So what do you, you just, you just turned 26. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's crazy seeing, you know, basically these kids are coming out of college and there's a lot of interest in college golf and they're coming out and winning in two, three years. I mean, yeah. the only other guy that did that 25, 30 years ago was Tiger. Right. 
Yeah, no, it's cool to see. And you're only 26. Excited to see you in the next decade in the PGA Tour and compete and, and win these majors that we're talking about. So beyond the course, right? Down here in Dallas. I think you're a big Stars fan, right? I am. Yeah, so did you drop the puck a few weeks ago at the, at the game? I did. Um, you know, it's kind of fun, like, obviously, you know, our connection with Pavs. But being in the Bay Area, like, I watch Pavs. Yeah. Like, and, and so once he came here and getting to know him and – um he's been so good to us you know and, and especially my dad because my dad went to sharks games forever and mm. you know I, I i say i'm all kinds of screwed up when it comes to my sports team allegiances because i'm cowboys stars warriors giants Makes but sense. i just basically it's the teams that i've gone to the most yeah um but yeah going to that was awesome um you know i when i dropped the puck jamie was screwing with me the whole time <laughs> um you know he's telling me to you know like don't fuck it up and you know there's jonathan tays going hey man huge fan of yours like you know can't wait to see you back and then there's jb telling me that i'm like yeah yeah have a good game asshole you yeah know? <laughs> i think i heard a story it might have been that the masters tournament you came in second place but um you actually recorded the stars game because you couldn't watch it and like watched it later that night or the next day yeah that's, well, a, I could, that's a diehard right there i love it i mean it's you know i i see razor at merido all the time too and so it's like you know, when he's in there, you know, he'll be in there like a the morning after a game. We'll just be sitting there talking about it. But I mean, it, it's fun entertainment because I mean, look, when I'm gone 33 ish weeks out of the year, you know, being able to just have the NHL app on my phone and, you know, watch the boys and then yeah. send paths the Julian Edelman, Tom Brady thing. Or, <laughs> You're too old. You're too like, old. <laughs> like every time he scores a goal, I keep sending him that video. It's unbelievable. So, what he's, he's, doing. So, he's so good. 17th I mean, year. It's just incredible. Um, so you played with Paz on the course a little bit, right? Yeah, no, I mean, typically it's, uh, him and me and then Baldy or Mike Baldwin and, and Tony Romo. And right. so I, Paz is, it drives me nuts because he'll like, it's like he came out of the bubble, um, a couple of years ago. And then he like literally first hole hits like a 40 yard bunker shot to like a foot. And I'm like, dude, I, I do this every single day yeah. and I can't do that. Like I, I saw him in the ACC tournament this past, uh, over the 4th of July and he was down in the first day quite a bit, and then he made a roaring comeback. And he lost to Romo in the playoff, which was incredible. But, like, it's just cool to see because, like, golf, like you said, is not his sport. Like, how far away is Pavs? He retires in a few years. How far away is Pavs from making a PGA run and getting his card? Is that even in the impossible? I mean, it is, but he'd have to spend, obviously, every waking minute of it. I yeah. mean, this is a part that's amazing is that he's probably a plus two, maybe a plus three, plus one, plus two, plus three. And, I mean, he plays, what, three months out of the year? Right. And he's able to come out and maybe shoot a score one day. I mean, it, it's just – it's sick. But, like, for him to, like – I'd probably say he's – four to five shots off of being like yep. a regular tour pro but that's that's not that's a no incredible that's not a knock yeah. i mean that's just saying like look this is how good these guys are i mean yeah. any guy that is on tour can show up to any course around town and shoot 62 yep. you know that's the difference and so like if pavs plays good he could shoot 67 which is sick i mean it's like ridiculously unbelievably good yeah but it's like the difference is is that you know these other guys will this is what we do for a living. Yeah. And but with how good his hands are, I mean, he could do it. Yeah. If he wanted to. I don't think Sarah would like that very much. She wouldn't. But. <laughs> she, she wouldn't. Uh no, it's cool to see. And so I by no means am making a PJ run. So I'm a twelve handicap, right? I gotta I gotta ask before we dive into some rapid fire, like as a twelve handicap, I've fallen in love with the game of golf over the last two years. And I play probably once or twice a week, hit the range here and there, but like What's just like one thing like a 12 handicap should focus on if they want to like get better, get into single digits as a golfer? So I would say get on the green as fast as possible. And what I mean by that is literally as a 12 handicap, if you hit as many greens as you possibly can, I'm even just take, saying just taking wedges from like 100 yards yeah. and just like literally aiming 30 feet away from it. Yeah. Like you'll laugh at how less the less number of doubles that you have i mean the whole thing when you're a 12 like how do you get from a 12 to an eight is make less doubles how do you get from an eight to a five that's when you go from okay maybe get a little bit better with the short game you know maybe get a little better with your chipping or less three putts how do you go from a five to a zero 
now all of a sudden that's the five to a zero part is going from a 10 to a five versus a five to a zero is like light years different. Right. And so that's all of a sudden now where you're like, okay, I now have like multiple shots with wedges around the green. I can hit it 280. Like that's just the recipe. But I mean, I think my three big things that I always tell people get on the green as fast as you can take more club and no doubt take as just eliminate doubles. Yep. And you know, tiger, I mean, actually had this thing that he did where it was, uh, no three putts, no doubles on no doubles or bogeys on par fives, uh, no missed up and downs and no penalty shots. And if he did one, he won like 90% of the time, mm. like one over, a, over an entire tournament. And like, I think, I think when I won, I had like eight. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's hard, yeah. but that's like, essentially what I'm saying is like, here's your 12 handicap version of it. Here's Tiger's level of it, which is that insane. But that just gives you the perspective of like, look, good golf is actually not something super sexy. It's just like, hey, if you want to go shoot 65, go birdie all the par fives, maybe hit one or two wedges close and you make one 30 footer. That's seven birdies right there. No need to be a hero out there. No, I mean, as I mean, Jordan's the one guy who you watch him and it's like, okay, here's another 30 footer. Here's another 30 footer. Like, okay, dude, stop. Like this is, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. a psychopath. Like yeah. maybe make a few pars. Like, right. you know, he, he's not afraid to shoot 34 with like on nine holes with like two pars. All right. I'll take it into account. I'll let you know how I progress over the next year. All right. We'll work on it. Yeah. All right. So some rapid fire here. You can go one word, one phrase, take as long as you want. Who's your favorite athlete growing up as a kid? Tiger. Favorite athlete to watch in current day sports. Who? Uh, probably Mahomes. Yeah, he's incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to say Brady, but just because he's the GOAT. Steph. But yes, yeah, Steph. I mean, how can I not say that? Yeah. I mean, Steph, Steph is sick. I mean, I don't know if you saw that video with the five full court shots. Is that real? I don't know. I think it is. I don't know. That, I think it is. I need to do some digging on that. I, yeah, I mean, I've, that is some alien shit. I... I hope it's real. Yeah, I hope it's real too. <laughs> I hope it's real, but I'm going to do some digging. All right, favorite club in the golf bag? Um, Pitching wedge. There you go. I've made a, lo I made a few hole-in-ones with it, and I think, I don't know why, I, like I've made more eagles, like hold out shots with that than any other club. Yeah. Very weird answer, but. I like it. Um, who is your dream foursome, dead or alive? Like celebrities don't have to be PGA guys, but who's your dream foursome? Um, we'll go, I've changed this around quite a bit, but we'll go Tiger, uh, Brady yeah. and probably Steph. I like that one. Yeah. Um, so now you've got two pros, two athletes. I think that would be my favorite. I've said Romo a few times, but I've played enough golf with them that I don't really care anymore. Yeah, I'm, I might I might go Tiger, Brady, and then just Sandler to make me laugh the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> have some comedic relief. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so what's the favorite course you've played? I'd say Augusta in the U.S., but St. Andrews is the world. Mm -hmm. Because St. Andrews, depending on the wind, like every hole is like, a different golf hole. Yep. I mean, like the 14th hole, when it's downwind, you could hit driver eight iron into a par five. If it's off the right, you could literally hit it in the wrong fairway. Mm -hmm. If it's off the left, you can hit it out of bounds. And if it's into the wind, now there's randomly three bunkers that are 400 yards from the green. They're in the dead ass middle of the fairway. And you're like, wait a minute. So I just hit eight iron yesterday and now I'm hacking out sideways from 400 yards into the wind. Yeah. Like it's crazy. I mean, but that's what I always tell people is like Augusta, hands down, no, no argument in the U.S., but there's nothing more, there's nothing cooler in golf than St. Andrews. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole town, I mean, everything's about golf. Historic. So pregame meal, Sunday morning, in contention, what, what's going on in the stomach? Um, pretty simple. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll do an omelet um, with like spinach and ham, do no cheese, you know. I'm I gonna... try to keep everything protein fats fiber so like just put some avocado in there um super boring i mean i feel like that's kind of like a brady answer the where, same way, where yeah. it's just very plain but i mean some of these guys like they'll 
have pastries and diet coke and yeah. an omelet and head of the first tea and i'm <laughs> yeah. like i'm like this is daily shit yeah like, the it's john just, daly like, this is diet. still going on yeah, like that's crazy but, yeah that's funny uh all right a few more favorite music artist this is a good one i'd probably lil wayne lil wayne the thro- the old lil wayne for old, me yeah the art he's just his lyrics yeah the best biggest fear this is a good one um I've gotten over a lot of like I used to be scared of heights and I've just gotten over that. Um I think so I think and this is honestly just kind of more like scar tissue. I've just had a lot of crazy landings and I've got an airplane background in my family, but I've had in the last 2 years I've had five flights what that were going down to land and have had to pull up Jeez. because of weather or wind or whatever and so like it's just kind of a weird feeling when it's like you touch ground and then all of a sudden they just take it straight to the moon yeah and so like that one i'd say that's probably the most like scarring for and, sure and then coming back around for the second time yeah like, and then it's shit. like and it's like hey this is you know you know, it's kind of your job here, you know, Mr. Pilot, like he's laying this damn plane and like, we got to do it again. Like, yeah. I don't really like how this is going. <laughs> right. Uh, last one. What is one word that best describes you? Uh, persistent. I like it. All right. So we talked a lot today about a lot of different themes. This last question to wrap it up. But if you have that one lesson that you've learned throughout your career that you could pass along to the next generation, help them accomplish their dreams, what would that one lesson be? Don't let the highs feel as high and don't let the lows feel as low. Enjoy the highs for sure. I mean, absolutely. But I've always been really poor at when I've played well to think myself into playing better, which is a great thing to do. But then when I've played bad, I think myself into playing worse. And so, you know, like I'm the type of guy where it's like when I'm playing good, it's like I I get cocky out there with my shot selection because I'm like, oh, you know, right pin, I'm going to cut this thing in there. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also the guy where it's like, if I played poorly, I'm like, well, oh, shit, I might lose my card this yeah. year. And it's like, yeah, if I take that back to even going back into junior golf, it's like, it was always, there was always like something I was working towards, like a D1 scholarship. Now you want to be an All-American. Now you want to be on a Walker Cup team. Now you want to be on Corn Ferry. It's like, it was always like, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do this, which the freak out of like when things aren't going well, is what makes people great because mm. it obviously means that they care and they're determined to get to where they're at. But at the same time, like if you work on the right things, you have a good work ethic, you can do what you want to do. Like it's, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Right. And so I think the attitude of a matter of when, as opposed to, you know, needing it right now. And, Oh, if I don't do this by this age, you know, I'm not going to be as good or blah, blah, blah. Like, I think that's my biggest thing. And it's something that I tell a lot of kids that are in college is just like, Hey, just enjoy the ride, learn as much as you possibly can use the resources that you have. But if you start playing poorly, like it has nothing to do with your end goal. Yeah. Like this is, you know, one step backwards to take two step forwards. So that's my biggest thing. Yeah. Life's going to be a roller coaster. You got to stay even kill and keep going so well thank you for the time today yeah much appreciated good luck in 2023 excited to watch yeah thanks man thanks man hope you guys enjoyed the show please subscribe to our youtube channel if you enjoyed the content there's plenty more past the torch episodes along with other podcasts we got going on and video series we do so subscribe and we'll see you later